Uh, good evening, Hilton Learning Community. This is Casey Kosorek, uh, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, at this point in time, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to welcome you to our first of four community forums that the district will be hosting this year. Uh, future dates include January 17th at 6 p.m., April 17th at 6 p.m., and June 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, this forum will be recorded. It's going to be posted to our website uh, for folks who would like to look back at it or who cannot attend it and would like to uh, view it at a later time. Uh, we also will be capturing a thought exchange that will also be posted to our website that will capture uh, the questions that were asked as well. At this point in time, I would like to thank our Director of Reporting and Compliance, Tracy Zabadel, for facilita uh, facilitating tonight's forum and for introducing the thought exchange and real-time questions. I'd like to thank our Director of Technology, Christy Schaefer, and our Network Administrator, Josh Ennis, for their technological support for this evening's event. I'd like to thank our captioner, Lee, for making sure that uh, this is accessible to all of the learning community. I would also like to thank our Senior Communication Specialist, Veronica Kiesi brown for communicating tonight's event and also supporting the evening's forum, along with Jim Barrett, our Budget Director. Tonight's forum will end promptly at 7 p.m. this evening. If you have questions that are not answered or you would like to ask them privately, please feel free to reach out to school administration via email or telephone. I'd now like to introduce our panel for this evening. Uh, we have Mrs. Kristen Polini, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, Mr. Ned Dale, our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, and Mr. Adam Geis, our Assistant Superintendent for Business. I will now turn it over to our facilitator, Ms. Zabato. Thank you very much. Okay, we are going to get started. Our first question is um, about International Baccalaureate um, Programming and the classes that students take. So uh, Ms. Polini, this is for you. A uh, person wrote in saying they recently received communication from the district concerning International Baccalaureate testing. Among other things, it stated that there was an expectation that the students enrolled in the IB courses and if they were, that they would take the um, examination at around the cost of $100. And the person is asking, does the district expect all students to take that? And if so, how is the cost justified um, on the parents or what are the options? So also contained in that letter is a line to let parents know that students do have the option. We strongly encourage and we would expect that if students enroll in the course, they'd be interested in taking the exam. It is something that is noted in the program of studies when students do their course selection um, each year. But if a student elects not to take the exam, there's no penalty. They can continue in the course, they can earn the credit for the course, and they can uh, have that appear on their transcript as an AP or as an IB course. Um, certainly, if there are students for whom the cost is prohibitive, we can work with those students. If students are recipients of free and reduced lunch, the cost of that exam is reduced to $5. And if there are students who don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, for, but for whom the exam cost is still a burden, we would ask them to reach out to their counselor or to their teacher or their assistant principal, whichever they feel most comfortable talking to. And we will work to, to help the students make arrangements where we can. Sorry about that, it's been a while. Thank you very much. Our next question is also about International Baccalaureate. I'm um, looking at the diploma program, advanced placement classes and um, access as well as dual credit at colleges, looking at exams and costs to families. This person would look, like to see a cost benefit of the following programs. International Baccalaureate um, diploma program versus advanced placement and then versus dual credit. Um, the cost to the district and the cost to the family, including the number of students who access and complete these programs. So the cost to the family will be dependent upon the number of exams that the child decides to take, as well as which courses they might enroll in for dual credit. So um, for individual families, that will fluctuate and vary. Unfortunately, I don't have those numbers um, off the top of my head this evening, but I'd be more than happy to put together some of that information and share it at our second community forum on January 16th. So if the person who submitted the question would like to tune back in, I can have those materials and answers prepared 
for our second community forum. I, I also would add an important note that um, we are comparing uh, different approaches. And I think I'd always like to remind the community uh, that every student is different and we differentiate our approach and we want to provide as many opportunities as possible to our students. Uh, so that really does provide uh, multiple opportunities and pathways for students uh, in many ways. But I also appreciate uh, Kristen's answer and the fact that we will be able to provide more information uh, at our next forum. Thank you very much. This next question, um, Mr. Dell, I'm going to ask if you can address. This person is looking um, to find out the schedule and the costs to the district for uniforms for different um, sports and athletic teams. And this person has a thought that the female sports may have less access to booster programs, um, less student involvement in the programs, so therefore it's more of a cost to the families. And they're wondering if there is a schedule for uniform replacement at all levels for male and female sports. So schedule for costs in sports, then looking specifically at females, their connection to boosters and access, and then um, if there's a replacement plan. As part of Jeff Wheaton's entry plan uh, in arriving to the district in uh, late July, uh, he has started to develop a five-year replacement plan. I know he has had conversations with the business office uh, to potentially accelerate that uh, in some areas for this year uh, so we can kind of catch up on uniforms that may have not been replaced in a timely manner. So uh, yes, a five-year uh, replacement plan schedule going all the way down to modified, including every level, uh, is something that you know we were hoping to see, and uh, Jeff has taken that on as part of uh, his role as athletic director. Uh, with regard to the um, access to sports boosters, I, I really can't speak to that. We, we don't have, uh, I don't um, it, do a ton of interaction with the sports boosters, although I know Jeff uh, Wheaton does. Um, but again, I know participation, um, you know, their participation with sports boosters, uh, fundraising, uh, depending on coaches, um, also varies. Uh, so again, do I have a cost split out of boys and girls? I do not have that in front of me. Um, I'm quite confident I could get it. Um, but again, the, the key is making sure, as, as Jeff uh, arrived, is making sure that students have the most opportunities uh, available to them and also making sure that they had um, jerseys and necessary equipment. Uh, we've also had some discussions uh, from a wide variety of discussions around a uh, number of helmets necessary for a variety of sports uh, and looking at those costs as well. So uh, we're doing it kind of on both ends. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna remind people that if they want to join in on our thought exchange, that will allow us to continue to take questions as well as sending them into the district communications on the website. On um, this next question is for you, Mr. Geis. We're gonna talk about safety and security in a couple different ways. The first one has to do with our security vehicle. This person says they've been very happy to see the security vehicle driving around the schools. They think the presence is very important. They're asking, do we only have one vehicle for the district? They understand that a request for more security vehicles would be considered through an overall budget, but they would like you to know that it would be great to see more. Yeah, that was a great new initiative that came out of our budget development process during the 22-23 school year. Uh, so that was a new initiative that was put forth by our Director of Safety and Security, Dave Anzana. And uh, yeah, so we have one vehicle currently uh, that's outfitted. It is in operation uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we are putting a lot of miles on. Uh, but it's great because they're able to get to each of our campuses, drive around, uh, help in different uh, situations and for different events. Uh, so it has been great. Uh, we did talk uh, initially about having another vehicle. Um, so that is something that could potentially come through as part of our next year's budget development process. So as we gear up and, and start uh, actually next month, uh, developing the 24-25 budget, that would be uh, something that could come through as part of that new initiative process. Thank you very much. This next one is from a community member saying that they understand our school doors are locked throughout the entire school day um, and after school. However, they're wondering, is there a daily or weekly audit to ensure that the doors are actually secure? Yeah, that's another great question uh, on safety and security. So we've uh, implemented several uh, initiatives uh, over the years to continue to build upon the security of, uh, for our students, for our staff, for the community. Um, having our doors, exterior doors locked is one example of that. 
Uh, those doors are monitored. So if a door is propped and open for uh, longer than a, a period of time that we set in the system, it will pop up and send an alert to our security team. Uh, it'll come up on their monitor so they can see what's going on uh, at those uh, locations. We do have, and we implemented this um, last year uh, at the end of March, beginning of April, uh, we do have a daily report that gets sent from our building custodians. And they uh, are looking at, um, as they shut down the building, whether or not doors are secured, whether or not windows are shut and locked. Uh, if they do find something that is open before they leave their shift, they do um, obviously secure that um, they are, before they arm the building and leave for the night. Um, so that is something we get daily. We've collected about five months worth of data now uh, during the school year. So uh, we looked last April, May, and June, and then September and October uh, so far in this school year. And we're starting to look to see if we can find patterns, trends, uh, so that we can then have further discussions uh, with building leaders uh, saying, hey, this door is always open and uh, it might need a repair. So we put work tickets in through buildings and grounds um, and things of that nature uh, as we see fit. So um, if we find a, a classroom window that's always open, we might be having a conversation with building administration uh, to have a conversation with the, the staff member in that room to just remind them to please lock and shut those windows uh, every night. So uh, we do have that on top of that, um, and that, that happens nightly. Uh, on top of that, we do have the, the security vehicle and part of their run is to actually get out and go around each of the buildings and verify. Uh, we do have an alarm company so that if something does breach one of the buildings, uh, it will send uh, to a particular call list, including our, our security who's on 24 uh, seven, but it will also go to our director of safety and security or director of buildings and grounds uh, as well if they don't pick up the phone on that. And it's usually policed by Monroe County Sheriff's Office and or the Greece police, depending on which building uh, the alarm goes off. And so we have a lot of different features uh, to keep uh, students and staff in the community safe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next question question is for you, Ms. Blaney, has to do with um, the middle school field trip to Washington, DC and fundraising that goes with that along with planning. So a parent was written in saying the eighth grade trip to Washington is more expensive than it has been in the past. The student cost is over $1,000. Um, this parent believes that last year it was approximately $875. Um, parents of current eighth graders were given the price a few days before the first payment was due. And it was mentioned at the meeting that there might be another fundraiser to help parents offset the cost. When can families expect an update on when and what the fundraiser will be? And also what steps are put in place to support for future eighth graders to offset these rising costs? So um, a few things are unfortunate in our current uh, economic climate. And one of those is inflation. And we do find that rising fuel costs, costs of hotels and other accommodations, excursions have risen in recent years. And unfortunately, that is reflective of the cost for students to attend the trip to Washington, D.C. this year. Um, I would have to uh, take some of that feedback based on the question and share with our Martin Williams staff that families are seeking some updated information on fundraiser availability. I don't have the actual fundraiser uh, here offhand, but can provide that information um, that inquiry, if you will, to our Martin Williams staff and ask that they do reach out to our eighth grade families to let them know what they can forecast for the types of fundraisers um, and the availability of how many will be left. Um, and I apologize, Ms. Vidal, I believe there was another portion to your question that I might have missed. Talking about the planning for the future. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we will take into consideration. We have uh, a number of staff members that serve on a planning committee each year for Washington, D.C. And as we continue to see costs rise, we'll be able to brainstorm and investigate other fundraising opportunities and might be able to start that even a little bit earlier um, in the process. We are, are currently doing some work with a local organization to work on increasing the amount of fundraising opportunities um, to diversify the types of fundraisers that our groups, our, our sports teams, our extracurriculars, um, our students can um, bring to their neighbors, their families and friends. Since we know that a lot of times we have similar fundraisers over and over again, we are often reviewing those requests as they come in to make sure that we have a variety of offerings 
So hopefully it keeps our community with um, new things to engage with as far as fundraisers go and also gives our students the best ability possible to raise funds uh, for that trip. We also do have uh, the great fortune of uh, Hilton Alumni Association, which has been generous in its um, awarding of a grant for students that uh, find it is not feasible for them to, uh, to go on the trip or can't raise all of the money. Um, there is a small portion of money that we can use that grant money for to help assist students who are in need. Um, it, it can't pay for the whole trip or for the entire eighth grade class, unfortunately, but we are trying to seek different avenues to make this something that every student has an opportunity in which they can participate. Can I put up the fundraising thing? So just leave that up for a moment. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I know that you just talked about this, just so people can see what we're about. So again, I will bring that feedback based on the question back to our Merton Williams staff and let them know that families are seeking the other fundraising opportunities that will be forthcoming in preparation for the trip and hopefully we get some information out to the community soon. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, our next question is um, for you, Mr. Geis. Um, this person's talking about the recent proposal for tax exemptions for different groups in the community. Um, it includes the veterans people um, with disabilities, people who have reached a certain age, as well as volunteer um, first responders in our community. And they're hearing that you're considering approving or not approving these exemptions. Can you please share a little bit more about what is going on with the exemptions, how this came about um, from the state, as well as the decisions that the board will be making? Sure, so uh, back in August, we did hold a public hearing. Uh, we advertised in the local paper. Uh, we put some information on our website. Um, I provided a presentation to the Board of Education uh, with basically the facts as I know them at the time based on information I received from uh, Monroe County. And uh, this is really coming from the brand new uh, first responder exemption that was just uh, enacted as part of the state budget. And with that, uh, we started to take a look at some other exemptions, uh, in particular, the veterans exemption, as well as the income limits for both senior citizens and disabled individuals. So uh, currently right now, we do not have an exemption in place for the first responders as that one is brand new. Uh, we also do not have anything in place for uh, the veterans exemption. That one's been out for some time now, uh, but the board at that point in time uh, did not move forward with that exemption. But because we are looking at uh, the, the new first responder, we thought it would be uh, prudent to also take a look at that. We do have an exemption in place currently, and it's been in place for quite some time now, and that's related to uh, our senior citizens and our uh, disabled individuals. And uh, it's an income-based uh, exemption, uh, which means that if uh, currently the, the maximum limit was $37,400, um, recently that has changed. Uh, and the state has increased that to 58,400. So the board can look at that and decide if they wanna change the income limits. If they raise those income limits, that means more seniors would qualify for the exemption. Um, so that is what was on the table uh, as we were looking at it. Um, and so varying people, depending on which uh, exemption they qualify for, uh, would be entitled to see a reduction in taxes. Uh, whenever there's a reduction in taxes, that means somebody else in the community or those that were not um, uh, eligible for that exemption, they would have to pick up the, the cost for that. So um, the exemptions that you're seeing on the screen now are, are those for uh, the senior, and that is the old limits. Uh, the proposed limits are up to the 58,400. So um, yeah, it, this is something that the, uh, the then governor for the, uh, at the time for the veterans exemption and now um, the, the governor at the time of um, the first responder uh, decided to uh, pass that down to local leaders and boards of education to make that decision individually. And so they're putting this burden on the, the local um, individuals in order to, to make that. So um, the board has a tough decision to make. Um, if it was an easy decision, it would already be made. Uh, we tried various ways to get information out to the community. Uh, the presentation you're seeing snippets of now is on our website. Uh, we did send out a postcard 
uh, to a thought exchange. We collected information from the community on that thought exchange. Again, these are all different data points that the, the Board of Education is using to ultimately make a decision on which way to go. So uh, there's a lot involved in it, uh, but in essence, uh, the district does not receive any additional funding. Uh, if they accept or deny any of these exemptions, it's simply a, a redistribution of the uh, property taxes that we collect from one group of individuals to another. Thank you very much. Um, and that presentation is right on our district website under the um, documents page or under the business office. Um, our next question is for you, Dr. Kasorik. There's been a lot of talk about the strategic plan and the changes. There have been some um, intermittent plans happening. Can you talk a little bit about where the district is and the executive leadership in terms of leading our district with the new strategic plan and what things are actually happening um, here behind the scenes that the community might not see all the time? Uh, certainly. <clears throat> you can, uh, if you're interested, go to the website. Uh, under the superintendent le link and strategic plan. Uh, that will allow the process, uh, outline the process from uh, data collection uh, to analysis to the creation of the plan. Um, so this new strategic plan, uh, we were able to uh, hold focus groups uh, with community members. Uh, we uh, met with administration, the board of education. Uh, we provided surveys for parents. Uh, we took the time to hold focus groups and survey with students in grades four through 12. Uh, so for the first time and, and some time and, and possibly ever, the district took the time to hear the feedback from all of those uh, different groups and representatives that make up our learning community. Uh, so what you did see on the screen is after all the data was coded, um, three overarching goals for our strategic plan. So for the next five years, uh, we are taking it one year at a time. And what we've done is met with um, our teaching staff, our support staff, our administration, and we've developed uh, action steps. Uh, so on the website, you'll see uh, there are two action steps uh, for each of the overarching goals for each department and each building. Um, so what we'll be doing is we've begun that work. That work's been communicated with our employees. Uh, we've set goals with our employees and we will be giving updates uh, throughout the year. That'll often happen uh, on the website. So you'll see updates on those goals. Uh, one of the ways that we are going to assess the progress of the plan is to uh, administer a uh, survey towards the end of the school year. And we're looking to do this annually to uh, really test to see if the steps that we've taken and put into place, uh, the action steps have made the progress that we were hoping that they would. Um, so it's an exciting time. Uh, we've worked with a consultant. It's a different way of uh, carrying out some strategic uh, targets and planning. Uh, but we're excited. Uh, we, we've got some really good feedback. And, and just an example, um, through that feedback, one of our action steps uh, to uh, communicate uh, better with our community is the community forum. So this is the first of four community forums. And this is one of the uh, action steps that the district has put into place uh, so that we can uh, be in acute listening and, and offer speaking up uh, so we can build a stronger relationship between the district and the greater community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this next question is for you, Mr. Dell. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, hiring and staffing shortages that we've heard about in other areas and we know you've reported on in the past. Can you please give us an update on how things are going with hiring staff in various departments, especially some of those that are tougher to fill and maybe some other ones that maybe people haven't heard about through board meetings or otherwise. How is hiring going in your department? Uh, you know, overall we've had a, a very favorable hiring season. Uh, instructionally on the instructional side of uh, Hilton schools, uh, we are fully staffed uh, at this point. Um, we are bringing some people on that are uh, transitioning from another district, uh, and those individuals will start in the next uh, two weeks. So we're very pleased about that. Um, on the operation side, uh, we could use uh, we could use cleaners, uh, we could use um, uh, 
a, a variety of positions, the classified side. Uh, we're always looking for bus drivers. Uh, so if you're interested and just thought about driving a bus or considering, I can't encourage you enough to reach out to our transportation. Uh, they do all the training. Uh, we had two drivers pass their road tests uh, this last week. Uh, again, I think it speaks to uh, the training environment of which our drivers learn. Uh, it's a quality environment. They make sure that the drivers feel comfortable. Uh, and even after they pass the road test, know they are not just thrown onto a route. Again, they're given support uh, as they transition to a route. Uh, and again, uh, I really give credit uh, to the team over, uh, over at Transportation. Uh, but if you go to our website, all of our job opportunities are listed. Uh, if you click right on the job opportunities, you can see anything from part-time to full-time. Um, what area? Are they district-wide? Um, we're always looking for substitutes. So if you're saying, oh, I can't work a full-time job right now, I can uh, take a part-time job. We are always looking for substitutes in a wide range of areas, uh, from teachers to teacher aides. Um, if, you, if you've previously driven a bus and are looking to just pick up a day or two here and there, again, uh, can't encourage everyone enough to apply. Uh, we do also have uh, two assistant principal um, secretary openings right now. So making sure we get those filled uh, would be uh, great. So yeah, we have some, we have some, uh, we have some vacancies that we're certainly interested in, uh, in meeting with people about and uh, in capturing their interest. Um, you're seeing postcards uh, being sent out to the district a few times a year, letting uh, individuals in the Hilton, uh, any resident in the Hilton area know about our openings. We found that we've uh, been very successful by using that strategy. Um, as everyone knows, the traditional uh, post in the Democrat and Chronicle or other media applications um, has not been uh, something that's been more successful. You might be seeing uh, more ads on your Facebook page or your Instagram page. Uh, and again, that part of that is our strategy uh, that we found uh, the best results uh, when, you, when you do some of the cost benefit analysis of uh, posting in areas that could be more expensive. So uh, again, uh, I can't also thank some of our retirees that have returned to the district to help us out. Uh, we know that we, we are so fortunate to have great educators here. Um, and when they see a need, uh, they, I don't know if they were quite ready to retire, uh, but we were so glad to have them back. And so we can't say thank you enough because uh, some of our retirees help, are helping us out uh, in, in hard to fill positions like technology, uh, like business uh, teacher. So again, we anticipate we'll, have, we'll be posting uh, many of our openings uh, probably early February and starting the recruiting process as early and then for a September start. Um, and so that's, a, that's, that's relatively new in the education arena uh, that you'd be recruiting uh, six, six months prior to a start date. Thank you very much. On this next question, maybe we can um, do in tandem, Dr. Kasarka, if you can start and then maybe Mr. Geist chime in with it as well. Um, this person's asking about some follow-up from in March when we had to do our unplanned evacuations two times in one week. And we held the forum giving a lot of assurances and ideas of things that the district was committed to doing to support families, children, and the staff. How has that been going? Um, this person's aware they've received emails from their children's schools that the drills are happening, everything from lockdown drills, intruder drills, evacuation drills, reunification drills, as well as fire drills, of course. Um, can you share a little bit about how that's been going in terms of process where we were in March to how we got to where we are now and maybe some of the future plans? And then Mr. Geis, maybe you can um, drill down a little bit into some of the specifics about what that looks like and what the drills um, entail so that we make sure that we're doing everything right and catching any spots so that we don't have any um, difficulties should we ever need to do that again. Uh, absolutely. So uh, great question. Uh, the district has come a long way. Um, one of the most important things that we've done uh, since those unfortunate days last spring is to roll up our sleeves and be reflective, to debrief with local law enforcement. Uh, we've uh, sent administrators and staff to professional development on uh, evacuation planning and reunification. Uh, we've revamped all of our plans. Someone earlier this evening uh, mentioned uh, the security vehicle. The security vehicle is also a key point in some of the work we would have to do. God forbid uh, we had a difficult situation. Uh, so we've been able to build off the drills. 
Uh, it's, it's a measured approach. Uh, we do not want to traumatize students any more than they need to be. Uh, but we also know that uh, if we get ourselves into a situation, if we've practiced it from the training that we've received, then the kids and the staff will know what to do. Uh, so I've been very impressed. Number one, I've been impressed with our students. Our students have been taking this very seriously, uh, have been good listeners, um, want to be safe, want their fellow students to be safe. And I also want to commend our staff uh, because they continue to, uh, through the feedback cycle. So this is a constant cycle of improving. It's not putting a measure in place and calling it a day. It's continuing to drill it and it's continuing to observe the drills and make different changes. For example, at one of the schools that we recently did an evacuation and reunification, uh, we learned that teachers were taking uh, attendance of students before they got on the bus, which is what our expectation is in this plan. Uh, but the way that we were loading buses were slowing down the evacuation. So uh, the administration of that uh, building uh, was able to make uh, some small changes and that improved the timing of us being able to dump a building, take attendance, load students on a bus, and go to our reunification location. Um, so we're gonna continue to uh, grow in those areas. I know uh, under uh, Mr. Geist's leadership and Mrs. Pellini and Mr. Dale and all of our building principals, Dave and Zana, our safety and security director uh, and all the administration and teaching staff, we've really been able to make some great strides. Uh, so as we move forward, we're going to continue to test our systems and it's never worked that's fully completed, uh, but I can uh, very proudly say that we are in a much better place than we were um, when we had to deal with that situation last spring. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more uh, with that. And uh, I'll just add a couple other things that we have done and, and debriefed on and taken into consideration. So, um, you know, Casey mentioned a couple of them. Uh, we've now incorporated transportation into our drilling practice. So um, we are utilizing uh, transportation to come over as kids are exiting the building, they're getting onto those buses. So we're practicing that, we're getting better at that. You know, when you look back at the March events, uh, that was every, every building at one time, right? So uh, we have to be prepared for that. We've reached out to some other districts uh, nearby so that if we do need additional buses or drivers, um, we have them kind of on call and standby and have a little reciprocal agreement uh, going with those districts. Uh, we also know that, um, you know, it may not be just best to load the students up, um, and keep them near the building if there is a threat. So we do have contingency plans on offsite locations. Uh, we're not gonna reveal those locations. Uh, we'll, we'll reveal them in the event that we need to utilize them, um, but we do have plans in place uh, for that. We've communicated, we've been in touch with uh, the different uh, areas and uh, places that we would be going uh, so that we have uh, a good plan associated with that. Uh, as part of our drills, we've also installed a new checklist that we're using. So uh, we, and we've also changed the um, individuals who are doing that. So we used to do a drill, it used to be at a building and the building administrators would go around and check the classrooms, make sure doors are locked, uh, make sure kids are out of sight, make sure that they're quiet. Um, so we have a checklist now that we can go through and start collecting data on uh, from that and kind of debrief with the, the building principals after each one of those drills. Uh, but one of the other things that we're doing is uh, in, a, in a real life emergency or an event like that, the building administrators of that building aren't going to be going to check doors and, and doing things. So uh, we're, we're having them actually lock down and practicing what they would do in an emergency situation. And we're having individuals from other buildings, uh, whether it be central office, uh, et cetera, come over and actually go through uh, the checklist in that district when they're going through a drill. And then the last thing I just wanna mention is, again, with uh, in relation to the March events, one of the really big lessons learned uh, that we took from that is when you're emptying 4,000 plus students and staff, uh, probably upwards in neighborhoods of 5,000 overall, uh, in today's day and age with the number of uh, kids that have cell phones and families trying to reach them, that uh, it basically crippled the Verizon network. Uh, we've been in communication with Verizon to determine how we can have better communication um, in, in events like that. And they indicated that as this was happening, they were seeing it in real time where uh, the cell towers were just being overloaded uh, and basically shutting down. So it made it very hard for us to communicate internally uh, with various individuals uh, as we tried to execute our plans. So we are uh, in touch with, I believe, the, the correct people now at Verizon. Uh, they are looking at various solutions. It's not gonna be a one size fits all, um, but 
for those of you that don't know, we do have a cell tower on our high school. We've had that there for several years. Uh, that is something that they're looking on expanding the capabilities of that. Uh, it'll definitely make an improvement at the high school. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to reach out to each of our other buildings. Uh, so that is something that we're looking at a multifaceted approach in order to improve the uh, cell service uh, during that event when, when the systems could potentially be overloaded. One of the other new initiatives that came through as part of our uh, budget development plan uh, as a new initiative was the replacement of our walkie-talkies. So we have now significantly increased the number of walkie-talkies that we have. We can now communicate with our buses, which we did not have that under our previous um, system that we were using. Uh, we have these available for those staff members that are outside with students, whether they're out at a playground, whether they're at a physical education class outside. Uh, so we, we've really expanded the role in how we communicate during those emergency situations. So those are some of the things. I know that there's probably others, uh, things that we've done that I'm not thinking of right now, but those are some of the additional ones that I wanted just to highlight. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Delaney, I am going to share a screen and navigate someplace on the website that's really important for um, community members, especially families, um, relating to some of our drills and emergency preparedness. So I thought I would walk through it on the website and you can maybe describe how families can work through Infinite Campus or their school to make sure their contact preferences are where they want them to be. Sure, one of the most important things that we, we, we knew going in, but when you live through the event, you really see it um, in its most authentic form. One of the most important pieces is the communication process. and. Um, it can be tricky when you are in the midst of making decisions very quickly with limited amounts of information. And as Mr. Geis put it, um, some limited resources with the uh, cell phone reception not working as um, smoothly as you'd like it to. And so we recognize the importance of getting information out to um, our staff in order to have them have the right directions and the next steps to keep our students and staff safe, but also very important to be communicating with our community, with our families um, and surrounding areas. So one of the things that we were reflective on after the March incidents was how many of our families were able to get that information as quickly as possible. And we use Infinite Campus in emergency situations to push out those messages um, as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. Infinite Campus is a, a great system by which to do that, but any system that you use is only as good as the information that you have in the system. And so it's incredibly important for our families to make sure that their information for contact in Infinite Campus is their preferred method. So for instance, making sure you have the right cell phone number in there or you've updated an email address. Um, and you can also choose some of your preferences for how you receive those messages. Um, emergency messages are turned on for families. Um, Ms. Vedal is navigating the website. There are some really nice step-by-step -step directions on our website where you can go through and follow those directions to make sure that the information you have in Infinite Campus matches the way in which you'd like to be communicated with in an emergency situation and also in non-emergency situations as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next question is for Dr. Sork. And just people are starting to get eager and anxious, I think, for the winter weather. And someone's asking if you can give a refresher and a reminder on what they might expect if there were to be a weather or snow day. Uh, yes, we have multiple options. Uh, if we were to get in climate weather and we were concerned about uh, student and family and staff safety, so we can uh, conduct an early dismissal. Uh, we can bring uh, folks in on a delayed start. We try not to do that. That's not ideal for any family, um, but sometimes we need to do that. So uh, if it's an hour delay, I know this seems like common sense, but you would just add an hour to the starting time. If it was a two hour delay, you would do the same. Uh, you can look for cancellation information uh, on our website. You would receive a call uh, outlining that we were closed for the day. Uh, and we still, with the traditional news stations, uh, have it run on the uh, ticker on the bottom. Uh, so basically, the decision to uh, close school uh, is, uh, is done in concert with the local highway department, 
Uh, we work with the Monroe County Sheriff's Department. I also work with our Director of Transportation, Mr. Matt Schultz. Uh, he's out early driving the roads, uh, getting reports in from other individuals who are out on the roads. Uh, I also will take my personal vehicle out on the roads uh, and we'll have some conversations. The district is very large. Uh, the weather in Hamlin can be very different than the weather in North Greece, uh, but we really try to err on the side of safety for everyone. Uh, and then we make the decision and we put the uh, call out. I'll also uh, touch base with our neighboring districts, uh, Brockport, Greece, Spencerport, uh, to see what those uh, superintendents are thinking as well. Uh, we try to make that decision by 6 a.m. Uh, because it does impact our transportation. Uh, we want to make sure that we can give everybody an opportunity uh, to make uh, plans uh, for child care if necessary. Uh, sometimes I get the question, well, can you call it the night before? And uh, in an ideal world, if I'm guaranteed to know that the weather is going to be bad, uh, there have been several times uh, during my tenure that we've been able to do that. Uh, we've had enough information knowing that uh, we need to close. And that's always nice, right? So I'm a parent as well. Uh, we can put our plans in place for the next day and that's very helpful. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, there's times when it does have to be a game time decision and we have to make that decision early in the morning rather than the night before. So uh, that's what we're looking at. We have we do have snow days budgeted into our calendar uh, or emergency closing days is really what we call them because we might have to close for a water main break. Uh, there's no power to a building, something like that. So um, I know often sometimes people say, you know what, the school's not taking emergency closing day because they don't want to lose state aid. And I just want to reassure people, uh, especially with my own children in the district, we don't want to put anybody in harm's way. Uh, we do live in Western New York, so we do have to be realistic about what weather conditions uh, we drive in, uh, but we want to be thoughtful. So with those days budgeted in the calendar, um, it certainly isn't a matter of we're not going to close uh, because of state aid. If we were to go in the excess of the snow days that were budgeted, uh, which is a very unpopular decision because then we start to pull days off of that spring break. So when people have plans, uh, they, they don't like that. But that's really the way that it works if we were to execute all of our emergency closing days. Uh, so we try to do it in a very thoughtful and measured approach. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, our next is um, for Mr. Dale. This person said that they heard Make It Their Friends Day is coming up and they are not connected to the school as a parent or guardian at this point, but just wondering, is there anything that the rest of the community might benefit from that? You need to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a joint uh, activity with the town and village. Uh, that'll be on the 28th, Saturday the 28th. Uh, there are multiple opportunities, again, uh, that were posted on our website, also on our uh, Insight. Uh, again, I think, believe we kick it off at Laveau at around 8.30, 8.45, uh, and then uh, typically uh, the activities start right around 9 o'clock, um, 9.30. So uh, again, at any time, uh, people are more than welcome to join, help out, lend a hand uh, for great causes. Again, all things around our community uh, and for our community to make sure that, uh, again, whether it's uh, packing a bus with food for a food drive uh, or whether it's uh, donating uh, gently used clothes and sneakers, uh, coats and hats, uh, there's there's tons of different opportunities for many people to get involved with. So I uh, look forward to seeing everybody on the 28th. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Blaney, can you just give a reminder about open houses, um, parent conferences? Where are we with family involvement in our typical fall activities? So one of the best places to look for updates on those dates for open houses and for parent-teacher conferences is on the district calendar that we have both on our website and also print and distribute to families as well. Uh, we've already hosted a, a handful of our open houses at different buildings. Sometimes we do have to um, host multiple uh, open houses at one building just based on the size. So for instance, if we have limited parking and anticipate a high percentage of individuals coming to partake in those activities, we may split grades K through four and grades five and six on a different night. Um, so those do happen throughout the course of the, um, the fall. We have parent-teacher conferences coming up tomorrow afternoon from three to six. There are also other conferences scheduled in November. 
certainly at these conference times, if dates don't work out for you or for your, your family, you could also always reach out to a teacher for either a phone call or for a conference on an alternate date um, as well, if that would be more beneficial. Or let's say that something comes up and you have a question or a concern is outside of parent conference season. Um, maybe it's in the spring or a little later in the winter season. Always please reach out first to the child's teacher um, to discuss any concerns or receive any updates. Um, and then certainly there are other supports in the, the buildings as well. So for instance, counselors or social workers, um, if your child needs some additional supports. Um, I do want to also just uh, remind individuals that you uh, can go on to our website and to each of the, um, the school buildings to find specific events that are upcoming. All of our principals have a different format on either newsletters or weekly family updates that they send out as well. That's another great place for you to find the information on upcoming open houses and parent-teacher conferences. Um, if I could steal a little airtime to circle back to the Merton Williams question as well, uh, I was remiss and did not mention that on the Merton Williams school page of our website, there is a tab for the Washington DC trip. There are updates there. The original parent uh, PowerPoint that was shared at the meeting is there for parents and guardians. Uh, and I believe there is some fundraising information there. Certainly, if after looking at those resources, families don't find the information that they're looking for, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Mr. D'Amico at Merton Williams. Um, but right on that Merton Williams page, you should be able to find in one of those drop downs uh, a Washington, D.C. Uh, tab there with some extra information. So my apologies at, at jumping topics. I just wanted to make sure that we had that information out to families as well. Thank you very much. I believe it will be found probably on Mr. D'Amico's um, Merton Williams Family Post, which is available right there on the website. Okay. The next thing, um, Dr. Kasorik, this person said there's a half day next week. They're referencing that it's also Halloween. Is that just a convenience for the district or what actually is happening on that day? Um, why do the kids need a half day then? Uh, well, it's not necessarily about uh, the kids needing a half day. Uh, there is a contractual obligation uh, to have consult days uh, with our teachers. Uh, during those consult days, uh, there's professional learning and there's opportunities for teachers to carry out some of the uh, duties they need to outside of the school day. Um, so they, they can't do those when they're teaching. Uh, so that is a part of the uh, of the agreement with the teaching association. Uh, what we look to do is we look to, um, I know it's inconvenient at times for families. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate that, uh, but we have to meet that obligation. And we try to move those days around. Uh, over the last few years, uh, families have found it convenient uh, that they would be able to start their uh, celebration early if they participate in uh, that holiday. Uh, and it had also worked well uh, for the staff. Uh, often what would happen is the harvest celebrations or uh, the Halloween celebrations, uh, whatever is happening can happen on that half day. Uh, and that learning can happen at that time. And then folks can be dismissed so the teachers can move into their professional learning and families can have their students. So once again, I know it's not totally ideal for families in childcare, uh, but it is an expe expectation with the uh, collective bargaining agreement with the Teachers Association. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, I'm going to take a pause for about two minutes and put up the thought exchange. So we'll mute for about two minutes. Just in case people want to add questions, um, they seem to be dying down. We still have a handful left, but just to make sure people know we're nearing the end. So I'm going to put that up and we will be back at 6.52.
they get a couple more questions, so about 30 more seconds um, for people to participate in the exchange. Great. Got a lot of people sending the questions directly into the website, which is totally fine. Um, if people were to use this, we would have them on there to see some connections and things, but we would need a few more thoughts and ratings right on the web. Okay, um, our next piece that we're going to talk about um, is going to be for Dr. Kasorik and then for Mr. Geist. Um, we're gonna start with something about stop arm cameras and someone said that they heard that they might get tickets um, with this and that it has to do with our buses keeping track of the cars. So Dr. Kasorik, can you give us an overarching um, idea on that concept? And then Mr. Geist, can you give us some of the specifics, what we're doing, why we're doing it um, and why it's actually pretty innovative? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so nationally, uh, there are a, uh, a good amount of fatalities that happen every year due to the fact that vehicles are not stopping when the flashing reds come on a school bus. Uh, and we really feel that if we're just saving even one life, it is extremely important for our community. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered uh, with a company, Bus Patrol, and we've also worked with uh, the county. Uh, Executive Adam Bello has been a leader in bringing this uh, to the county. And what happens, and I'll let Mr. Geist talk a little bit more about the logistics, um, but we are in a warning period right now. If uh, you were to pass a bus with flashing reds, um, you will be uh, sent a warning. Uh, when that warning period is over, um, you would be ticketed. Uh, that is not funding that comes to the district. That's funding that goes to Monroe County. Uh, they have a position that collects and carries out those fines. Um, what the company has done is they've outfitted uh, all of our school buses with the appropriate technology, uh, not only to uh, report folks who have run those flashing rides, but also to improve our safety and security on the bus. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Geis talk a little bit more about the logistics behind that. Yes, thanks. So um, as, as Casey mentioned, you know, safety of our students is our top priority uh, with this. So in New York State, um, it's upward of 50,000 vehicles that are passing school buses that have their uh, red flashing lights on. And really the most vulnerable spot for students uh, is when they're loading and unloading a bus. So when those reds come out and the buses stop, it doesn't matter if you're on a two lane road, a highway, a divided highway with four lanes. If the reds are out on a school bus, uh, you need to stop. That's the law. And we have had many instances and many close calls, even within our own community, where we've had vehicles that are passing our school buses. So we have roughly uh, 100 school buses uh, in our fleet. Every single one of those buses have been outfitted uh, with cameras, uh, the stop arm cameras, as well as cameras on the interior of the bus. Um, the stop arm cameras uh, were in all, actually all the cameras were installed at no cost to the district. Uh, this was something that was um, done by bus patrol uh, in conjunction with Monroe County. Uh, they will, uh, as uh, Dr. Kasorg mentioned, um, we are in a um, warning period. That warning period began on October 15th and it runs through November 15th. So if a vehicle passes those stops, uh, a stop school bus with, with the red flashing lights, uh, they will receive a letter in the mail, um, giving them the information, the details on when it took place, where it took place, um, and that it took place. Uh, but starting on November 16th, um, it, it's going to be fully implemented, meaning that it's not only to come with a letter, but it's also going to come with a fine uh, that's going to be administrated through Monroe County. Again, the school district does not receive any of the revenue from those fines. Um, it's just the cameras are on our buses. It's a safety feature, um, you know, keeping the, the safety of our students uh, at the forefront of that. The first time an offense takes place, uh, it will be a $250 fine for that motorist. Uh, it goes to the registrant of the vehicle. And uh, if they have subsequent um, issues where they're passing a bus, then there is an incremental increase of about $25. I think it tops out at $300 um, of a fine over a, a, a 30 or 60 day period. And then it resets uh, after that. 
All right, at this point in time, uh, we are winding down. Uh, we do have a stop at 7 p.m. Uh, so what I would like to remind everybody is that our next forum is going to be on January 17th at 6 p.m. So mark your calendars, uh, tell your friends and your neighbors. Uh, I also want to encourage you to visit our website. Uh, we have a uh, communication outline. Uh, so what we want to do is be the most effective administration and school district that we can for the community. So when you have questions, uh, take a look at this flow chart. The communication flow chart will give you different situations or incidents that you might experience and who you should contact. It's not that as a superintendent, I don't want to speak to you. I'm happy to speak to you. I'm happy to meet with you. Um, but due to the fact that I may not be in every one of those situations, we can more effectively solve problems and re resolve situations at the lowest level. So uh, calling the teacher, calling a coach, moving through the flow chart. Uh, you can see it's coming up on your screen. Uh, like I said, this is also located on the website. This gives you a nice... Uh, communication flow chart and understanding of how we can best resolve uh, any concerns that you might have. Uh, and we've broken it down under different subtitles of interest as well. Uh, the other thing that I would ask uh, of you is that it, it's very easy to attempt to get our information from social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. I know there are some different neighborhood platforms. There's the Nextdoor app. And, and, and that's fine. I, I'm not judging the use of those social media platforms, uh, certainly. Uh, but if you want the answer from the horse's mouth, uh, I strongly encourage you to reach out to the district, uh, call, email, visit the website. Because unfortunately, sometimes as information gets passed from person to person, it can often become inaccurate. So uh, we will give you the factual information. Uh, it, so I would encourage you to tune into these forums to call, to email, to set up meetings, because we truly want to do the best we can uh, for the district. Uh, so on that note, I do want to thank uh, everybody for tuning in. I want to thank everybody uh, on the district staff uh, who made this happen. And I want to thank you for continuing to be welcoming and affirming in our community, in our school, and curious, not judgmental. I wish everybody a good evening. Take care.